Welcome back to Finnegan's Garage. Thank you for hanging out with us once again, especially you guys and girls that went to fsmgarage.com this month to get merch. You bought hats, hoodies, stickers, everything you need to go out in the world and not be naked. And I appreciate that because every dollar you spend goes right back into the project vehicles and our poor financial decisions. This video is all about working with aluminum. We're gonna show you how to pie cut tubing and make the tightest bends you've ever seen in a turbo system. Uh, we're also gonna work on our 21 foot Eliminator Daytona jet boat. We're gonna teach you all kinds of cool things, how to build seat mounts, how to finish the cold side tubing, the science of jet drives, and how we're gonna make a brand new one work in our 21 foot Eliminator Daytona jet boat project. That's right, that's the five seater one. That's gonna take four knuckleheads and me really fast across lakes. I ain't riding. Oh, see? Right <laughs> as you pan back, he's like, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I'll go. go. You know you are, dude. It's I know, I'm going to. It's going to be like game over, but with room for your friends. And, uh, and the jet nozzle and I'm not facing down. Sold it to my wife under the guise that it's her boat. It'll take you one time with a bunch of passengers and be like, all right, y'all get out. They're making the boat slow. That is a thing. I've done that before. I've literally gone 80 miles an hour. That sucks. Everybody get out. All right, now we're going 95. Because the weight penalty in boats is way harder mm -hmm. than it is for cars. You would kick us out? Oh, you're damn right. If it meant winning. You would kick us out? Yeah, I mean, I'd give you a cold beverage and a life preserver, but I'd definitely kick you out. I mean, I'd come back for you after I won the race, but yeah, you go swim. Swim. Can you swim? What? Yes. Can you swim? What? Me? Yeah, of course I can. Right. Without a life preserver? <laughs> I've had to jump in the water and pull you and game over back to shore before. I just can't remember whether you were, you know, I, want, I didn't know. I can't remember if you had additional flotation or whether you could are you, tread water. What are you trying own. to say? Maybe you can't swim. I don't know. <laughs> On with the project. What are you trying to say? <laughs> Stay tuned. Continue. <laughs> This here is a two and a half inch diameter mandrel bend tube made of aluminum. We got this from Motion Raceworks, and this is really easy to work with when you're plumbing your turbo system or just building an air intake. But what do you do when that 90 degree bend is way too big and takes up way too much space for your specific application? Well, you take a straight piece of tubing, pie cut it, and end up with this jewel the tightest 90 you can possibly make out of that tube. Look at that, look how much smaller that is compared to this. And that's what we had to do to finish the charge tubing on our Eliminator Daytona jet boat. Last episode, everybody was commenting, you guys need to move the turbos, switch them from left to right, put the charge tubes discharging up top. It's gonna be amazing. Well, we had a plan the whole time and maybe we didn't communicate it very well, but our plan was to leave it exactly the way it was and make it as compact as we possibly could. And I'm gonna show you how and why right now. And then I'm gonna show you how to make this at home with some pretty simple tools. Okay, let's talk about turbo placement. In the last video, Dave and I talked about where we wanted these and we, we talked about how we wanted them tucked into the motor, we wanted them lower than the intake, and we talked about flipping them left to right and having the turbo outlets come up high. Um, we tried it, we didn't show it on the video, but we did try that. And ultimately we settled with the turbos like this and with the discharge down low. Meanwhile, everyone on the internet was like, no, no, the Nelson Racing logo is upside down and it's, it would be better if it was up top because you could go right into the throttle body. And what I don't think anyone could see in the video is that you can't do that. And the reason why is, we've moved the turbos forward, the discharge is now here. So if you flip this around, it's going to run right into the side of the intake. It's not gonna be an easy transition into the throttle body, nor will it be a very attractive transition to the throttle body. So what we've done is run them this way. We're gonna tee them together and then come into this 90 degree fitting that you can get from Motion Raceworks. Um, the other thing we're gonna do is, after staring at this even more, we realized we can move the turbos even further forward, making this whole thing even more compact. So right now, Nuber and I are gonna take the turbos off, 
shorten the 90s by an inch and a quarter lengthwise and move the turbos even further forward, which gives us a little more room down here to merge the two and a half inch outlets from the turbos into the four inch 90 going into the throttle body. So there's the reason why they look the way they do. I know they're upside down, but for our purposes, this is the best way forward. Um, this is all in the name of keeping a walkway open on each side of the boat so people can get on and off because when this boat sits in the water, it sits like this and it's a pretty tall boat for a 21 foot boat. It's not easy to climb up over the side of this when you're in the water with a life vest on. And so I wanted to set it up so that if we're out floating in the middle of the lake or the river, we can climb up the back of the boat and get in. Um, the other thing people were asking me about is why did we go with a log style manifold instead of an actual header? Um, well, to be honest, this isn't a max effort race deal here where, you know, I do believe a, a true header design probably makes more power. This is very compact and very efficient in terms of build time. We were able to put this together, mock this up in a few hours. It was easy. Um, a header would complicate that. A header would also make this whole deal wider. So that's why we went with these. The other question people had is why aren't we water jacketing the exhaust? Um, time, more than anything. It will take way more time to build a water jacketed exhaust. And I don't think it's absolutely necessary in here. We'll have to build heat shields, yes, to protect the fiberglass, but this isn't gonna have an engine hatch covering anything up here. Um, the motor, you know, you buy one of these intakes, you want the world to see it. So there'll be no hatch covering this deal. This is a hot rod boat. So no hatch, no water cooled exhaust. This is where the turbos are gonna go, except they're gonna go a little further forward and we're gonna continue on with the build. All right, Newburn, we know what happens when you try to cut a mandrel bend in the middle of the bend, right? Right. Because even though it's mandrel bent, it's pretty good as far as tolerances. The truth is what you're doing is you're stretching the tubing when you bend it and the diameter changes. So if you cut in the middle of these bends, you end up with tubing that's not exactly round. And if you try to cut it at severe angles to make pie cuts, to make an even smaller deal, you end up with tubing that's darn near impossible to weld back together. So. Yeah, it takes a lot of massaging to get it back round and to match up again. So. Right. So for the people at home, school them on how they're gonna take a straight piece of tubing and turn it into that right there. Cause that's pretty amazing. So I didn't know that the pie cuts weren't out of bins already. I never knew they were out of straight pieces of, you know, tubing. So I Googled, the first guy that popped up was a Fab Forums on YouTube. Kyle he, Voss, yeah. Yeah, dude, I mean. Smart dude. He nailed it, he made it very easy for me to understand how to do it. And uh, basically, this tool here marks the center of your tube. And it, this is for roll bars, and it goes up to like, I think, two inch tubing. Yeah, well, this is the Centurial toolkit we got last year that yep. we used for the C10 roll cage. Let me get you a marker, hold on one second. So step one is to take your tubing, and you wanna mark the center line of it, of both sides, because that's your reference point later on. When, you're, right. when you're putting all these pie cuts back together, see that nifty little line right there? That's the line we drew down the middle of this tube on both sides. Yep. And you used that, right? Yep, so basically I spaced this up in a way that gives me an inch and a quarter to the tip of that marker. And I would hold the tube steady and just run it down it like that on both sides. I made sure to hold the, you know, the tube steady and went to both sides, marked it. Now I have a mark on each side. And that's important because when you put this in the saw, you have to mark, make sure this is center. And then you make your cut, then you flip this over to your other mark Make sure it's center and make your make another cut. And then that gives you all of these. Right. So, so we're our goal here is to make a 90 degree bend for what we're trying to do. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, a couple different tools you can use. If you have a horizontal bandsaw, that works mm -hmm. great for straight tubing. Or if you have a really great chop saw, uh, this is all reliable. We've had this for years. We bought it from tricktools.com. The Fine Slugger, it's about $500 saw. Mm -hmm. The benefit of using this saw is the blade doesn't deflect hardly at all. It's not an abrasive chop saw. So the blade doesn't deflect. It leaves almost no slag. That's a fresh cut right there, right? Yep. So it makes 
pie cutting tubing like this, which basically what you're doing is you're cutting it in one direction, then you're gonna rotate the tube over and cut it in another direction, you can make cuts that require almost no deburring, no cleanup afterwards, and they're very, very straight because we're not using an abrasive chop saw. I don't have a horizontal bandsaw here to do this, but that would work very well. These are untouched. I did not clean these. This is how I came off that saw. Right. And so look at the fit up. There's, there's no gap there, which means welding this after the fact is gonna be pretty easy. So for the folks at home, what's the math here? So I, you, basically you set your, your saw at nine degrees. And when you make one cut and rotate the tube over and cut it again, it makes a total of 18 degrees. Five of those is 90. You can make a tighter, smaller radius for like a total of nine degrees, but then you gotta split that. And it takes, what, 18 of those to make a 90. Right, so let, let's not confuse the folks at home. So this piece right here is cut on a nine degree angle on each on side. On each side. So that's a total of 18 degrees. When you stack five of these together, you end up with a 90. A really tight 90 degree bend. And once you have a really tight 90 degree bend, show them what we can do with this, Dave. Dude. Take it over to the book. Let's, let's show them. Let's here's, show them why we were doing this. We talked why. earlier, we were telling you guys there was a reason that we weren't flipping the turbos over and we weren't gonna have the charge tubes up here. And that's because if you flip this over, the charge tube ends up here and it runs right into the throttle body. Not easy to plumb. However, if you put a 90 here and you get yourself a really tight pie cut 90 degree deal there, look at that. Suddenly we have one of the most compact, cleanly plumbed turbo setups I've ever seen in a jet boat. Yeah. And it's all thanks Man, to that, that little dude. beast right there. Yeah, I love it. So right now he's gonna cut some, show you the cuts. Yep. And then we are going to TIG weld those together and make two more little pieces to go in between. And the cold side, minus the fact that there's no blow off valve on it, will be done. All right, so this one's already cut at this particular angle here. And so what I'm Which gonna do- is what? That's at a nine degree angle. And the way I figured that out was this other nifty tool you have. Right, so step one is to set your saw at nine degrees, which is yep. what Dave's done right there. So once this is at nine degrees and you make one cut, you need to do the same on the other side. Yep, that's the, so hence you, the two marks. So you rotate the tubing and flip it over. And I totally guessed at the spacing on where to put the blade on this. I did all of those at half of an inch off the edge. So basically I'm gonna put it right there, mark this at half. I'm gonna center my blade on that piece or on that mark. I'm gonna center the blade on that mark right there. Okay. Snug this guy up. Verify that I'm on the center of my mark there, which should be an inch and a quarter, which is dead on. One more little snug. And he's just barely yeah. snugging the clamp because it's aluminum. If you squeeze it too yeah. hard, you'll compress it and it won't come back. Ready? Yeah. Look at that. That's all it's there. Yeah, one little chip to break off. Yep. But look, the tubing stayed around. Breaks off. And look essentially, with this blade and the saw, it cuts as fast as you want it to. The harder you push, the faster it goes through the material. Yeah. And it's incredible. How clean and how precise and how straight that is. And then you just take it over here and yeah. Line up the marks, and boom. Done. Now you just take all it together.
It's my first pie cut ever. Dave's first pie cut. Killer job cutting it, by the way. The fit up was just money. Took a couple of tries to figure out the weld settings um, using a Miller Dynasty 280DX. I was pulsing it. Um, well, this was about, it's 067 tubing with the pulse. I was doing it at about 92 amps, um, 0.7 pulses per second. And uh, this is the result. It uh, penetrated really well. And we'll go back in there with a cartridge roll and uh, flatten all that out. But this is not gonna break. And again, that is a much tighter radius than we would have gotten out of a mandrel bend. So like if I line this up right here, you can see there's where the tube would have gone. This is where it's gonna go for us. And with this transition, we will go from two and a half to three, and then from three to four, right into our icon throttle body and elbow. Check this out. And the pie cuts were necessary for us to make a ridiculously compact cold side here. So that's gonna go there. This is gonna go about there. After a little finessing of our Y fitting right there, we can probably tweak that down just a little bit, do some trimming on this and this, and then this will all fit together. And again, this is why we are running the discharge outlets to the bottom, not the top. If they came out the top, they'd run right into the intake and the throttle body. So this is uh, what we believe to be the cleanest way to do this. Dude, I could take a quarter of an inch off of this piece right here because it's straight up about half of an inch. Yep. Raise this whole thing up. Dude, I think we're gonna be super close. Yeah, I love it. Let's do it. We're close to finishing this. Then we can start eyeballing exhaust tips, where the wastegates are gonna go. A lot of fun things. All right. So you think we can tack that on there and then just trim this or trim this and then fit it again and then tack it. Well, this this particular piece, this side of it's not cut very straight, but like I said, that, that may help us. So let's get it up on there and kind of rotate it a couple of times and see where it, the right. least amount of gap and uh, we'll put some marks on it and tack it. Sweet. It's gonna work good. All right, so. Yeah, what I would do at this point is weld these two pieces together. These two? Yeah. Okay. And then you can. Uh... Yeah, because there's really no, there's not much left of these to, to change. Right. But there's a, there's a good bit left in this guy to, yeah. to modify. It's gonna work though. Yeah. Let's do it. So I can weld the rest of this then probably. Yes. Yeah, I don't see that changing. There's not a lot of material there to actually trim back okay. without it changing diameter. So you're good there. I'm gonna I'm gonna round this because it's not it's kind of like oval shaped right now. So I'm gonna round this, put it in the bandsaw, and cut it at a slight angle. Okay. And I think that'll put us in the ballpark. So then it's just a matter of just kind of finessing this a little bit here and there. Right on. This is a Motion Raceworks dual seal connector, and uh, I, don't know, I was feeling froggy, so I just welded the inside of it instead of trying to fill the big gap on the outside. Never done that before. Hopefully it works. We'll find out. All right, so what you're looking at here is the jet drive out of Game Over, which has been freshly rebuilt. And this is the new jet drive for the unnamed boat. This is Wifey's Whip. Um, this will go in the red Daytona. This will go back in Game Over. There are some subtle differences between the two, which is why we're making this video. And uh, let's start with Game Over's jet drive, all right? This is what's called a Dominator jet drive. That's a brand that the American Turbine Company owns. It is, what I want to say here. 
Silk. I was about to say it is silk. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so it's a Dominator Jet Drive. Um, you can buy these from American Turbine or any of their other retailers. This is a race jet drive. It has been fully blueprinted inside and out. It was just rebuilt by the guys at Marine Performance Design in Costa Mesa, California, because we had broken the inside of the bolt. So let's, let's talk about what these are. So this is the suction housing or intake. This is where the water comes in. This is the bowl, the impeller is inside of here. This is a nozzle adapter and this is the nozzle. Now this one looks different than this one because it has this valve on top of it. This is a pressure relief valve. This one will eventually get one, I just don't have it yet. The other differences between the two of these, other than the fact that one is silver and one is black, is that this one is new and these parts are thicker and they've been treated to a process that makes them stronger. So all these pieces are made out of cast aluminum. These two pieces have been stuck in a high temp oven with pure argon forced into that oven under extreme pressure. It's called hot isotropic, isotopic pressure something. It's called a HIP process. Basically what it does is you heat up the aluminum parts you force argon in under extreme pressures and it forces out all of the air pockets from the cast aluminum. Basically eliminates the porosity making all of this stuff way stronger than it would be normally. So not only is, for example, this suction housing twice as thick as this one, but it's inherently stronger thanks to the hip process, which is pretty cool. Uh, physically, it looks different. Physically, it looks different because the guys at Big League Racing in California which is the outfit that machined and blueprinted and assembled this one, also CNC'd the bowl to lighten it. So that's these scallops here. This one is stock. This one's been extensively lightened. Um, according to the internet, I'm not sure. I have no idea because I'm not a scientist. Um, CNCing this actually can make it stronger somehow. I don't know if it takes out stress risers or what, but I'm not a scientist, but I've drank beer with them before and they tell me something, I tend to believe it, you know, works for me. So you got Dominator suction housing, Dominator bowl, place diverter droop snoot, which is a, an adapter that adapts the bowl to your nozzle. And then this is a place diverter nozzle, which is that thing that we've shown you before that goes up and down and shoots a rooster tail and sets the attitude of the boat. This has a similar function, goes up and down, but it has something I've never seen or worked with before. And that is these fingers right in here. They kind of look like a jet engine and they kind of move like one. So this has an air bladder surrounding it. And when you put air to it, these fingers squeeze down, making the exit of the jet drive smaller, increasing the pressure. When you take the air away, it opens back up making the exit larger, increasing the flow. The idea here is squeeze it down for the whole shot, open it up once the boat is moving for maximum flow. And uh, I'm told it works, never used it, but we're gonna try it out on this boat. This is by Henry Morris. So this nozzle looks a lot like that one, functions very similar to it, except it has that feature right there that you won't find on another nozzle out there. So yeah, the other thing this jet drive has that this one doesn't is this item. This is called a Jetaway 2. This is a ratcheting mechanism. You grab these handles and you can move this forward and backwards and it will disconnect the input shaft to the jet drive from the drive shaft to the engine. It does two things. It allows you to disconnect the jet drive and run the engine when the boat's on the trailer without the jet drive moving, which is good. Um, it'll also, when this is connected and you're going really fast, if the engine ever locks up, it allows the impeller inside of the jet drive to freewheel. And that gives you a margin of safety you wouldn't otherwise have. So the way a jet boat works is water comes in the bottom of the boat, goes into the jet drive right here, goes in here, the impeller is spinning, the impeller squeezes the water out the back of the boat. If the engine ever locks up because there's no transmission here, the engine stops turning, the impeller stops turning, but the boat's still moving fast and all that water goes in there, hits the impeller, lifts the back of the boat out of the water, slams the nose of the boat down and you crash. So this can help that. Game Over's jet drive, really good. The new jet drive, also really good, but significantly stronger 
and has the ability to have a quote unquote neutral here with the ratchet and also has that nozzle from Henry Morris that we've never tried before, but should help this thing whole shot better. I don't know, we'll find out this summer. So that's going back in game over. This is going to go in this boat. So as I said before, the suction housing is redesigned. It is way thicker, way stronger. So in addition to the hip process, everything is burlier. The spine right here is four times thicker than the spine of the original jet drive. See how thin that is? So the original spine is about 400,000 seven inch thick. This is over an inch thick right here. And also the bearing support right here, as you can see, is much wider from here to here and has a rib that comes all the way down here. If you look at this one, much narrower, no support coming down other than right here. This was all changed because these jet drives were developing cracks uh, in high horsepower situations or applications where not only did you have high horsepower, but you had a boat jumping in and out of the water, that water coming in, you know, loading and unloading would just hammer these parts and break them. So this thing heavier, but way stronger than this one. Alrighty. Mm -hmm. So I've taped the gasket in place so that hopefully it doesn't slide. We're sliding this in. Oh wow, all right, that went really smooth. I got this if you wanna try and line some holes up. Damn, that pop off. It's gonna try, place. it's gonna try and... I got you, I'm okay. not gonna let it go. What other brands are there besides the Dominator? Like, is there, are they interchangeable with the intake of the boat? Like, yeah, so that's a marine performance design, low profile intake. And most all of the jet drives out there will bolt onto it, whether they align very well or whether the contours inside fit very well, it just depends. But um, it all started in the late sixties with the Berkeley pump company. That's what's in mine, right? You have a Berkeley, yeah. Okay. And then over the years, there's been Jacuzzi, Panther Jet, Legend. Um, there was uh, Dominator, American Turbine. Um, God, what was Dave's company? I had one. His, I had one in my boat. My there was another one. I can't remember it. But uh, there's been a bunch of them over the years. This is the most popular for racing. This, this is cool. We got you. You down here filming, Mikey. Uh, a little <laughs> roll reversal. Mm. <laughs> He's so excited. Yeah. Mm. Is that on your phone? Yeah. Oh God, no! It's not on his. It's phone. on my Android. Oh. What are you talking about? My Android tells us all about life. Look at that Finnegan's hairy arm. <laughs> as long as you upload it in HD, it'll look good. <laughs> you know what? You need to shut your mouth. Yeah, you probably let that go. Can you grab a half inch, please? You need a half inch wrench and um You know long since you're in the socket too. Pop off somebody close, dude. Yeah. I don't want to body work the boat. No. I don't, I don't know how you do that and make it look good. Well, it, it would be possible to fiberglass an indentation in there, but then you got to match the gel coat. I don't want to yeah. do that. I'm hoping that 
If we have to, we can shorten the pop off. You fix anything with flex tape. Flex tape, flex seal. Flex yeah. seal, flex tape. You guys look like twins. What? Mm hmm. Got a different shirt on. How about the cordless impact? <laughs> Every time you put something on, do you feel excited? Oh yeah. I'm so excited for summer. I'm so excited to give people rides in this thing. After they sign the 12 page waiver. That's important. Yeah. We're gonna put a like a machine on the boat. We'll just print it out. Just push a button, print it out of the boat. Oh, we can name the boat Implied Consent. But that would all depend on what you implied and what you consented to. Or no means no. Yeah, Cotton. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the theory here is for the whole shot, you want a small diameter. And then on the top end, you want to open this up for more volume, right? Well, there's these rings that go in here and these rings effectively limit how big this can go. So if I put air to it, it's going to shrink down smaller than any other nozzle on the market. So that shrinks down under three inches, I think like 2.7 inches. So it'll squeeze the water, increase the pressure, hopefully hold the whole shot, and then when you take the air away, it will open up to whatever this ring size is. And these rings are available in a bunch of different sizes from Henry. This one is three inches, 60 thousandths, and it comes in steps all the way up to three inches plus a quarter. So 3.250, here's one, 3.140, 3.200, Basically, you can squeeze this down to like 2.7 inches and then open it up once you're done hole shotting as big as three and a quarter inch for max flow. So this is going to be fun to play with. How is that? The question I ask is, is the water coming out of here? Is that what is this going to open the pressure back up because the bladder shuts it? Right. So, so to go bigger than that, would it, you see what I'm saying? There's an air bladder around this. When you put air to it, it squeezes it for the whole shot. Right. Then you take the air away, it opens up naturally, but then you also have the water coming through here to so squeeze it right. even further apart. That's what I'm saying. This is so cool. And this is a three right here? Uh, I don't know what one we have in here. I'd have to go through the three, calipers. One, it's a three, one, two, five. So three and an eighth exit diameter which is a pretty common size um and let me show you this so so game over has a similar setup but you cannot adjust it on the fly these are inserts that you can change here and you can buy these from place diverter they're all different sizes so this is 3.080 uh here we go here's three and a sixteenth three and an eighth here's another three and a sixteenth you can change these right but they're fixed. So you have to find a happy medium between an insert that gives you a good hole shot and maximum top speed. Once it's in there, unless it falls out, nothing changes. Henry's nozzle gives you all the advantages of a really small insert, but then a really big insert later on when you're running. So the theory is squeeze it down to increase pressure during the hole shot when you don't have a lot of volume going into the jet drive. And then once the boat is moving and you have that 130 mile an hour water coming in here, you open it up to increase the volume coming out of it and reduce the pressure. I'm so excited to try this. If you've noticed from previous videos, the seats were already mounted in the boat. They were bolted to pieces of angle aluminum. This is quarter inch thick, 6061. It's neither attractive nor lightweight. So we're gonna fix both those problems right here today. Step number one, we could use a Sharpie to mark our lines. You know, obviously that's semi-permanent, works good. You can get it in fine tip or fat tip, but we want a little bit more precision with this deal. So we covered the whole thing in Dicom, which is a steel, blue colored machinist layout fluid. Uh, and that gives us the ability to then use a scribe 
to put very sharp lines in here. But you can see that's our layout. And all we're doing here is marking areas where we want to remove material from this aluminum to make it lighter and a little more attractive looking. So this is the top side where the seat's going to bolt to. There will be two of these, one on each side of the stringer. The seat will sit on top. And when it's all done, this is the end result. We're basically going to machine some windows in this on both sides. The side that bolts to the stringer and the side the seat sits on top of. And again, it, it looks cooler and it's significantly lighter. So, scribe the lines in. You can use a circle template or a coin or a washer to get your nice rounded corners there, whatever you feel like. And then you've got a lot of options for how to take the material out. We're gonna use the old Bridgeport mill because we have it and it works really well. Um, full disclosure, I am not a machinist. I've never been to school for it. Odds are good while I'm doing this, you're going to see stuff that is either dangerous or inaccurate or not the right way to do it. But uh, I don't know any better and I'm not dead yet. So we'll continue to do this until you guys in the comment section say, hey idiot, this is a better way to do it and you show me how. Because um, unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to go watch instructional videos on how to do this particular job better. And also, if you ever tried to Google how to machine a window into aluminum L brackets, weird stuff comes up. It has nothing to do with this. Um, so I did look, I just couldn't find anything that was very helpful. So we'll continue doing it the way I've always been doing it, right or wrong. zeroed out. Here's the stock bracket. Two pounds, right on the money. And after about 45 minutes of machining, 1.23 pounds. So we've shaved three quarters of a pound off of this thing, which may not sound like much, but there's four brackets, right? So that's one and a half pounds, three pounds, right? No, three quarters of a pound, one and a half pounds times two, yeah. We shaved three pounds out of our seat brackets. That still doesn't sound like much, right? But if you do this to everything you make for your race car, or your boat or whatever, it all adds up and it's free horsepower. It's free lapse time. It's, you know, you know, it's not free. You gotta buy the tools and it's your time. How much, you know, how valuable is your time? But still like, I didn't have to go buy a lithium battery or titanium stuff. I just took material out of a part that didn't need to be there. And consequently, the boat's going to go faster. It's going to be quicker. So there you have it. I think I did the math right. Three pounds. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Just keep telling myself I did. If I did it wrong, you'll tell me in the comments. That's pretty good, though, dude. You almost, like, it almost took half the weight off of it. Yeah, like, almost. And that was way more, honestly, that was way more than I thought it would be. And you probably could take more out of it, you know. That slot, you could have a smaller slot here, you know. Yeah, you could have drew this up here, like, mm -hmm. like that, and then come across and did something like that. This one could have been wider. Yeah. Like, there's, there's things I could have done, but I didn't want to lose all the strength. This will work. All right, there we go. Now, of course, we're going to speed through all the machining processes because, again, not a machinist probably doing this wrong. So who am I to tell you to do it the way I'm doing it? That's probably not safe. So, But the important part is lighter. Look at that. Not quite done, but real close. We still need to put a blow-off valve in there. And we still need waste gates on the hot side, but the basic layout of our twin turbo setup is finished. And uh, I could be totally wrong about this, but in terms of jet boats, 
I think this is the most compact setup like out there. It was super easy thanks to stainless headers. For the log manifolds, that really made placing the turbos really easy. Uh, Share fab for the awesome reducers to go from the T4 flange, two or three inch tubing. Motion race works for the Icon throttle body, which really made plumbing this thing easy. And then uh, Kyle Voss for his excellent tutorial on YouTube for how to pie cut straight tubing so that we could make that really tight bend right there. Um, Next up is to blow the whole thing apart. We've got to put oil returns from the turbos into our oil pan, uh, button up a couple things on the motor mounts, and then after that, it's wiring, plumbing, and more fun stuff on the Daytona. So stick around. We'll have more content here shortly on Finnegan's Garage.